This is Big Ideas from the ABC. Thank you very much, Meredith, and thank you to Sydney Ideas and Sydney University for having us here tonight. Um, just in case you don't know much about the Centre for Policy Development, who are the other co-hosts of this event, uh, we are a think tank, as Meredith said. We're dedicated to making good ideas matter and to combating short-term thinking in the public and private sectors. Our new sustainable economy program kicked off this year. It's looking at how to put the value of nature on the balance sheet, starting with projects on fisheries and forestry. And it's also mapping out some of the policy drivers needed to bring Australia's economy within environmental limits and if you're interested in finding out more about that program, just sign up on the sign-up sheet that's uh, near the door on your way out. Um, so the reason that CPD jumped at the chance to have Gunter Pauli speak is that his work shows us in vivid detail with already working examples how an economy might flourish that has its boundaries set by nature. His work shows us that that future is actually here already, it's just unevenly spread. Gunter will tell you about left field technologies and business models that challenge the assumption, an assumption that's particularly widespread in Australia, that rapidly reducing resource consumption and waste is all too hard and too expensive. Many of Gunter's examples are highly profitable even in today's conditions. And in ordinary times, the kind of industrial revolution that Gunter talks about might run its course with very relatively limited intervention from government. Like the dot-com boom, it, it will just make sense. Um, the research that sparked it would be government funded or it might be government subsidised. It would draw on the skills and knowledge of people educated in public schools, uh, trained in government funded universities and TAFEs. It would rely on good governance and well-regulated financial markets to flourish. But it would mainly be market forces that drove the take-up of that new technology and the transformation of those business models. These, however, are not ordinary times. Our economy is smashing up against multiple environmental limits at once. And the latest science is showing us that the urgency of bringing it back within those limits is so great that it is going to take a smart and ambitious mix of policies to get the speed of economic transition that we need. So just for example, the uh, Climate Commission's really important report last month showed us that we now know that our present rate of emissions, Australia would run out of its carbon budget to 2050 within five years. Now that means that we need much more than a 5% emissions reduction target and a minimal carbon price uh, in order to get the kind of transition we need. In this context, we do need economic policy that, like some of the innovations that Gunter is going to be talking about, draws its inspiration from nature, enabling an economy that is in some ways resembling a rich and diverse ecosystem of industries and businesses, uh, an economy in which nothing goes to waste and no resource limit is exceeded. What we don't need are policies that lock in dependence on our most resource hungry and least sustainable businesses by putting the growth of fossil fuel exports ahead of the support needed to enable sectors like tourism, agriculture and manufacturing to become sustainable over the long term. And I think that some of the implications of what Gunter is working on for the manufacturing industry are particularly interesting, and I'm hoping we'll hear some of those tonight. Um, so just a little bit about Gunter. He's an economist by training and an entrepreneur by vocation. He's done everything from founding sustainable startups to advising the Bhutan government on economic development strategy based on the gross national happiness index principles. He established the Global Zero Emissions Research and Initiatives Network, redesigning production and consumption into clusters of industries that are inspired by natural systems, based on open source research and experimentation with a worldwide team of scientists and design thinkers. The culmination of Gunter Pauli's work is the Blue Economy, which plans to provide it plans to prove 100 manufacturing innovations with viable business models that could generate 100 million jobs in 10 years, all with zero waste impact on the environment. Pauli is also working on a plan to replace all nuclear power in Germany with renewables in 10 years. Um, so without further ado, please give a very, very warm welcome to Gunther to talk on the blue economy. Thank you very much. Are you warm enough? Yeah. yeah. yeah? Depends on where you sit, eh? Some, you know, you really get a lot of heat uh, blowing at you. Um, I'm a Belgian. I live in Cape Town, but I'm a resident of Japan. 
So it gives you a little bit of the, the kind of global species you have uh, standing before you. Um, what, I'm, what I'm going to try to do is to give you a series of uh, concrete examples, cases, uh, not too much theory, go as much as possible into the practice. And, and let's agree that whenever you don't agree with something or you feel like you want to make an immediate comment or a question, don't wait till the end. Okay? So whenever you feel like it, stop me, ask the question. I like this to be as interactive as possible. Um, and I'm going to need someone who's going to be very careful with my time because I get carried away with the things I'm doing. And I could easily go on for two, three hours in one stretch. So when you think it's about time I go over to questions, you know, give me a good sign and uh, I'll be happy to do it. Now you, you may ask yourself, why, why, why is this the blue economy? Well, you probably know the green economy, right? To me, the disadvantage with the green economy is that uh, whatever is good for your health and whatever is good for the environment is expensive. And I just don't think that's a very fair way to go about in this life. We should have the best, the cheapest, the indispensable that we need should actually be the commons. And I believe that we have too much forgotten this in tremendous uh, commercialization that our societies have gone through where we have accepted that what is good for you must be costing you more money. Um, and, and that is why the blue economy is an economy that is driven by innovations, by creativity. And it has a whole series of principles that uh, I will, in my first part, try to share with you. But before I do that, I, I would like to just pay tribute to all of these people that have influenced me. I think it just doesn't make sense to, that for you to think that I'm the brain behind all of this. I'm the product of dialogues, of interactions, of uh, mentorship from so many great people over the past uh, 40 years that uh, maybe you recognize a few of them. Anyone sees anyone they recognize? No, no, all sees in there. Yes? Okay. Who else? So I've been influenced by strangers, huh? Yeah, it sounds like it. Um, you, you don't know Bruno Kreisky, former Chancellor of Austria? No? Let me see. Lester Brown, does he ring a bell for some of you? Lester Brown is there, second row, number four. Um, yeah, Hazel Henderson. Who knows Hazel? Ethics Markets? Yeah, well, thank you, you saved me there, Ian. Fritsch of Capra. Yeah, Fritsch of Capra is there, second row, you know. So anyway, Carlo Petrini, you know, Carlo, slow food. Yeah, that's, you know, there he is, third from the bottom, you know. So I've been having the great luxury of working with all of these people. And I think the blue economy is really uh, an amal amalgamation of so many of the great people who have been trying to best to get that green economy and that local economy going and, and we kind of need to crystallize into a fresh look at this reality. The Simple Show explains the blue economy. This is our planet. Of course we want to preserve it for future generations and therefore we choose healthy and natural products, organic food, solar energy and biodegradable soaps. But all these goodies cost more. Whatever is bad for your health and damages the environment is cheap. Whatever is good for your health and saves the environment is expensive. This green economy will be for the happy few. Most of us cannot afford it. Worse, some stuff we thought is great for us and good for nature actually is not good at all. Biosoaps use palm oil from plantations that destroyed the rainforest. Solar energy depends for decades on subsidies, which must be paid with tax money. Bioplastics compete with food. Organic food is shipped around the world, damaging the climate. So it is not only expensive, sometimes it is not smart either. So we have to be more creative to do it better. 
we must open our eyes to see what we've got. For example, here is our morning coffee. We really only use 0.2% of it. What do we do with the rest? Throw it away? We use it to grow mushrooms, then feed the leftovers to animals. Animals make manure, and bacteria make biogas from that. We thought it was only waste. And now, everyone who knows this can generate food, energy, and jobs. We like that. And there are so many opportunities. Once we see them, it is clear that we can convert poverty into development, scarcity into abundance. If we can make the cake bigger, it is easier to share with everyone. However, many people have good ideas. What we need are people who make it happen. We need these entrepreneurs. Actually, we need a whole generation of entrepreneurs. They do not care how the apple falls down from the tree. Newton figured that out hundreds of years ago. They want to know how the apple got up in the tree in the first place, defying the law of gravity. These innovators think like David, who beat Goliath. Without experience and little money, they change the rules of the game and generate more money for themselves and their community. That makes everybody happy. This is our goal, making people healthy and happy with what we did not know we have. And after all, the sky is blue, the ocean is blue, and our Earth, as seen from the universe, is also blue. That's why we call this the blue economy. It has only just begun. For more information, visit Ziri.org. A little summary that explains you a little bit better what I'm doing, but I would like to insist on this reality. Whatever is necessary in life should be cheap. And whatever is indispensable should be for free. Now that is the basis of how I look at the economy. That's how I look at how we should design society. And the only way we get there is through innovations. And here are some of the innovations that I've been involved in over the years. In 1984, I was standing there and I looked at this barren land that was deforestated savannah a hundred years before. The Spaniards arrived, they wanted to have the meat, cut down the rainforest. That's not Brazil, that's the Orinoco Basin between Venezuela and Colombia. 20 million hectares of rainforest was cut down. This is the result after 25 years. We regenerated the forest. Yes, we started with a monoculture because we needed to change the physics of the land. All the biologists, all the forestry experts told us that when the pH of the soil is four or less, you can't grow anything there. Well, I see it standing there. Can't cheat anymore. We have 8,000 hectares, and it's because we didn't look at the chemistry or at the biology. We studied the physics of the land. The monoculture was chosen based on the only species that would survive the pH of 3.8. Now, there's hardly anything that survives in the pH of 3.8, but if you have a tree that can actually grow in there, that tree will change the temperature of the soil to the point that the soil is a lower temperature than the rain and then the rain can penetrate. The problem is as long as you have a hot soil nothing will ever penetrate inside. So we needed to have something that was resistant and that was a pine tree from Honduras not from the Orinoco and that pine tree was combined with a mycorrhizal fungus and the two together survived. So that from the original 17 species, 256 species today thrive in that forest. So it's kind of counterintuitive that with a monoculture you get biodiversity. That is possible because that pine tree cannot reproduce in that environment. That means it's a temporary physical contributor, physical contributor, not chemical contributor. And if it were to behave like a eucalyptus, we wouldn't have those results. We know that. 
but eucalyptus can never survive in a soil of 3.8 pH. So here you see how it was, we were able to turn this around. Now, I must admit to you, when you succeed in turning a savanna back into a rainforest and you regenerate biodiversity, you tend to be a bit of an arrogant cookie. Because if you can do that, what can't you do? So part of the philosophy of the work we do is we do things that have never been done. And when people tell me it can't be done, I'm getting interested. Because that is where we can bring new borders, new pioneering efforts, new concepts to the table. But we have to make it work. And we have to make it work financially. I've been instrumental in the creation of 12 companies. Two companies didn't survive. The others did well. As a result, I always will look at whatever we do, not just from a cash flow point of view, but I look at it, what is the value we're generating with this initiative. Now, when you have a piece of land where even the water is bad to, to drink, and 80% of the local population suffers from gastrointestinal diseases, and then you have a piece of land with this forest where you're not only regenerating biodiversity, but you're generating jobs, drinking water, food, energy, fuel. You have your self-funded hospital. Then you have a piece of land that generates revenue. The result is that the land that was acquired for about one American dollar per hectare today is valued at $3,000 per hectare. Now, that's factor 3,000 over 25 years. That's a better return than if you were to have invested in Microsoft shares and held on for 25 years. Now, who has heard about a story where you have a better financial return in regeneration of a forest than putting your cash into Microsoft? Now, that's the kind of credibility that I would like to submit to you that we have. I'm not saying that everything we touch is going to be gold. Not at all. We will fail and we will continue to fail on regular occasions. But what is very important is when we've been able to push the limits forward we think that we can do much more. And, and my first great experience in, in ecology was really the creation of this factory, a detergents company. I was competing head-on with Procter & Gamble, Unilever and Henkel, producing soaps that I presented to the market as the most biodegradable soaps ever. I gained 3% market share without advertising because I didn't think we have to brainwash women that I can wash whiter than white, as they still do 50 years after the campaign started. The three years budget for advertising was all put in that little factory, a wooden factory. But what I didn't realize is that I was using palm oil, and I made palm oil so popular in the early 90s that we started destroying the habitat of the orangutan. So here I am. The innovator, the guy who puts biodegradable soaps on the shelves at the same price as those synthetic soaps, but at the same time, I changed the standard, which became a palm, palm oil-based standard, and that meant I destroyed the habitat in the orangutan. In 1992, I went to see Paul Gilding fellow Australian, some of you may know. And I said to Paul, I gotta get out of this. He said, but take your time. He said, I can't. How can you take time when you know you're destroying the habitat of the orangutan? In 1992, I was the sole supplier of soaps to all Greenpeace ships. I didn't supply to the Queen of England, but I was supplying to Greenpeace, which was not a bad marketing tool in those days. And I asked my friends at Greenpeace to stop using my soap. I said, what are you talking about? I said, of course, because we have to change the business model. And that is how I decided in 1994 to sell all my business activities and create this zero emissions research and initiatives to focus on the creation of new business models that do not have unintended consequences. Business does not want to have bad influence on environment or bad social impact. But sometimes we're ignorant because we're trained as MBAs to focus on our core business, on our discounted cash flow analysis, 
on our market shares, on our P&Ls. And since we're so focused on that, we don't see that we have unintended consequences. But the moment you know you have the influence, then your unintended consequence becomes collateral damage. And whereas the military pretends that they can tolerate collateral damage, civil society cannot. And therefore, I created this initiative in Japan three years before the Kyoto Protocol. I was asked by the Japanese government to provide input on what kind of new business models could emerge. I worked with 2,800 Japanese corporations over three years' time, and I must admit to you, no one listened to me in Kyoto. They were busy doing other things. But I had had the opportunity for three years to work with 80 full-time professors at my disposal with a $10 million budget a year, which is not bad, $1994 this is. And so having these scientists at my disposal, I as the entrepreneur was looking for the new business models. I had no, no interest at all amongst policymakers in those days. No one was interested. And so I got so frustrated with it that I decided to change things completely around. I was looking in my office in Tokyo at the United Nations University, and I had all these pictures with all these heads of state, and the only thing I could remember was the picture, because nothing happened. So I scrapped all the pictures, and I have none of these pictures anywhere anymore, and I said, I'm going to start working with children. I'm going to have to start inspiring children. So I started telling stories to children and wrote them out. Today we have about 17 million stories distributed in many languages, including Arabic and Japanese and Chinese. When you're living in an environment of Kamakura, who has been in Kamakura, Japan? The beautiful bamboo temples there, it's absolutely gorgeous. When you live in that environment, and I lived in, in a typical little Japanese tea house, very minimalistic. I had only one table, the rest was all tatami, shoji, ofuro, and my garden. But my garden was a very special one because I had flowers every day of the year in my garden. That's the beauty of Japanese gardens. I was fascinated by bamboo, and one of the initiatives that I took in the year 2000 was to create the world's largest bamboo structure ever built. Now you can say, now you're going on to megalomaniac trips. The ego was going a little bit too big. No, my ambition was to change the concept of building industry, because a billion people in the world live in bamboo, and they all think that the bamboo is the symbol of their poverty. And in order to change that thinking from being the most sustainable building material away from that thinking of the concept of poverty, I needed to have a building made out of bamboo with a German building permit. Now, any of you is a construction engineer? If you're a construction engineer, you probably know the German construction engineers are the tough nuts, you know, very tough. But we succeeded in convincing the German government and the authorities that that building to the side, which is a copy of the one you saw before, is built according to the German code. Why do we do that? We do that because I wanted to engage in social housing. And here you're seeing the little technique that we designed with simply nine different basic designs, we can teach someone who can't read and write how to build their own house with 65 poles of bamboo. 65 poles of bamboo, you can harvest 65 poles on 100 square meters, 1,000 square feet, in three years' time. So in the end of the day, we were not building their own house, we are growing our own house. It became the title of a book published by Vitre Design Museum in Germany. But here's the house. How much would you pay? Well, how much do you think it costs?
No, it's not for free, huh? It's not for free. Five hundred bucks. Um, which kind of bucks are you talking about? Um, no, no, five five hundred. I couldn't do it. It's twelve hundred dollars. Twelve hundred U.S. dollars for that house. But it has a balcony. <laughs> and we particularly aimed at building it with a balcony because for the majority of the people, if you have a balcony, you're middle class. If you're living in bamboo, you're poor. A bamboo house with a balcony, you're middle class. Sometimes you have to worry about the images. The beauty of it is that when we got the building permit in Germany, it was a Meisterstück, a masterpiece, because never ever had this been built in Germany. And if you have a masterpiece, then the people who build it are masters. And as a result, my 41 Colombian workers went back home with a master diploma, which normally takes about 10 years in Germany. They got home in five months with a master diploma. And I'll tell you, if you go and build around the world with a German master diploma and you need a visa, no difficulties. You just put that, you just put that on the table, you get your visa. These people have been building thousands of structures in bamboo around the world. And it's the kind of work that I've been doing over these past uh, 18 years is to push the thinking so much further that we've had now the opportunity both in Brazil, Ecuador, Venezuela, Colombia, we have more than 40,000 hectares of forest, of bamboo forest regenerated. Not just forest, bamboo forests. Because bamboo was the main forest in the Andes. It was not the tropical rainforest as we know it. And so the regeneration of a bamboo forest requires the demand for bamboo. And so I needed to work on the popularity of the bamboo so it's not for the poor but also the rich wanted to have it. And if you check your Architectural Digest, any of you subscribing to Architectural Digest, then you will find that David Bowie has a bamboo house, uh, Mick Jagger has a bamboo house, uh, Richard Branson has one, Ellen McPherson has one. And by having all these people go for bamboo houses based on the building permit of the Germans, we have been able to shift around the thinking and get policies in Latin America to focus on regeneration of forests of bamboo. It takes time, it takes dedication, it takes a bit of pain sometimes, but it's worth it. Our thinking has been much influenced by the ecosystem. I'm not one of those who admires how the color of a hummingbird is determined by the refraction of light. What I'm fascinated by is how the ecosystems function. Ecosystems have the smartest way of dealing with raw materials, of dealing with emissions, of dealing with minerals, of regenerating life, of generating conditions conducive to life. And to me, what we need to do as policymakers around the world is to create conditions that are conducive to life. And life as a system, not as an individual species. And that is why, to me, it's very important that we define what is a com competitive business model. A competitive business model, inspired by nature, is one where sustainability is the capacity to respond to the basic needs of all. And I put all in red because it's everyone who's alive on this earth, not just us here. With what we have. Now, this is where we're really differentiate from a lot of other thinking, because we only operate within the blue economy concept with what we have. No, we can't use the other half of the earth, which we don't have, as we're doing today. You use what you have, and you use it creatively and innovatively. Here is one of my favorite projects. It's from Benin in Africa. Who's been to Benin? Wonderful, three people. That's a very unique audience. Have you been to the Songhai Center in Benin? No. Well, you missed something. Because the Songhai Center is one of those incredible eight hectare pieces of land that is the biggest uh, inner city organic farm in Africa. Eight hectares. Do you have an eight hectares organic farm inner city 
Sydney? One coming. One coming. That's been there since 86. I mean, Africa was a bit ahead, right? We don't expect Africa to be ahead of our time. But in 1986, this was started. Now, when you have this integrated farm system, what you're seeing here is a maggot farm. I know that's not on your priority list. You want to farm a lot of veggies, you want to farm perhaps some mushrooms, you're happy to have a fish pond, but maggots? Uh-uh. Now this maggot farm needs, to, needs some explanations because the maggots, here's a little picture to give you the appetite, the maggots have this incredible capability to convert slaughterhouse waste, the waste of abattoirs, into protein. A maggot is 80% protein, but the maggot has something else which is very unique, it's saliva. I'm sure you've seen these uh, horrendous programs with people who have uh, some ulcers. They cleanse them out with the maggots. Now, we don't do that anymore. We make the, excuse me for the words, but we make the maggots throw up, and then we get the saliva out, and that saliva is the best wound treatment in the world. Because the saliva has this capacity to generate small micro, um, electromagnetic fields that stimulate the growth of the cells. And that is how diabetic wounds, ulcers, close up in two weeks' time. The problem is, to farm the maggots in Europe or in America, it costs you over a thousand euro a litre. We can do that cheaper and better. We produce about 10 tons of maggots a week now. Can you imagine 10 tons of maggots? That's quite a few maggots. Can you imagine how much they their saliva is at a thousand euro per liter. That means we have a system whereby the biggest cash revenue of the organic farm is the saliva of the maggots. Now that's not your typical American business model. That is where we look at what is the most needed product at the highest price generating a revenue that allows us to finance organic farming in a city like we haven't seen the cash before. We've never seen that before. Because we're not just interested in tending to the veggie gardens, we're interested to generate revenues responding to basic needs. That's our definition, is we want to respond to the basic needs. And so, on top of that, we're offering an excellent wound care locally that is normally only available to the very wealthy Europeans who can ship it by plane back to Europe. And this shift around is one of those typical examples. But the second case is that when we operate within our blue economy, we always try to operate with ambient pressure and temperature. Now, the traditional way of us dealing with heat, beat, and treat. I mean, heat it up, put the high pressure on there, bang it all up with mechanics, and that's how we operate. Now, that's one of the reasons why we have so many carbon emissions. Here you see one of the most innovative and creative ways of producing fiber. This is a silk fiber. It's a silk fiber that is manufactured exactly the same way as spiders make their fiber. And spiders, they cannot create 200 pressure. They don't make sulfuric acid. They don't do that. The spiders only can use pressure that's between one and one and a half bar. It's not very much. And they control moisture. And he, this is Fritz Vollrath, the scientist from Oxford University, who has designed not only the system of manufacturing a specific silk type that is stronger than titanium, the way it's being manufactured is exactly the same way as natural systems do it. Another basic concept that we apply in our blue economy is that we substitute something with nothing. Well, you say, this time it's going a little bit too far. Maybe. Look at this here. This is a four kilogram block of titanium. That is what is required in order to make the Ferrari Formula One steering wheel. You take the four kg block, you machine it into a smaller and smaller and smaller piece, you start boring in all the holes, and in the end of the day, you have 300 grams that has been used. 
everything else is wasted. Of course it gets recycled. You ship it off to another place and there it gets recycled. Thanks to plasma technology and 3D printing with laser, both combined, you generate a density that allows you to only with 330 grams, 330 grams of titanium powder, you make the same steering wheel. When you make that, you actually reduce the amount of material you needed by factor 12. You reduce the waste by factor 100. And whatever you had as a waste, you can use it right away in the next steering wheel. Now all of these industrial devices you see there are all manufactured with a plasma technology plus a laser technology that uses as much energy as your iron at home to iron your shirt. As much energy as you need to iron your shirt. Provided you still have a good old cotton shirt and you don't have one of these nylon shirts which don't need any ironing. This manufacturing system has eliminated the mold. Normally everything that we have from this microphone to this little computer frame, everything has gone through a mold. In China they can make molds for $2,500 a piece. In Europe it costs you $25,000. So, since you're having more and more products coming to the market, you need to change those molds faster and faster and faster. And since you're changing these molds all the time, well, it doesn't become competitive to actually do it in Australia or to do it in Europe or in America. The Chinese do it. But now we have no molds anymore. If you have no molds, no machining, no polishing to be done. It's all done directly. Like you do a printing system 2D, you now print 3D with a tremendous pressure. This is the end of globalization. It's the end of globalization. It's over with this technique of globalization. Because we're seeing the opportunity, as we have done in the first market, which is the dental market. We've seen the opportunity to outcompete the Chinese within a year's time. You probably don't realize, but 85 to 90% of all denture metal pieces sold in Australia come from China. That's why it takes you a couple of weeks before they put it back in. It has to come from China. With our systems, the 3D printing with laser, it is possible to have your dental fixture delivered to you within, delivered to your dentist probably, delivered to your dentist within two hours. Locally produced at half the cost. That is manufacturing today, not tomorrow, today. It means that, for example, the market where this was first rolled out is Belgium. That in Belgium, within one year, 55% of the market from the Chinese was taken over by Belgian local manufacturing. And by the end of this year, there are going to be four manufacturing plants in Belgium. The complete market will be taken over from China. No more Chinese production, local production. But what kind of production? It is not anymore the typical machining and the tooling that we know. It is basically a 3D designer that gets digital images from the dentist who actually makes it fit, the little metal piece, makes it exactly fit into your mouth according to your mouth, according to your digital print. A hologram that is appearing on the screen and it's fitted in there perfectly, exactly as you need it. And today there are only six types of implants on the market. That means if, you're, if the implant that the, that the dentist has doesn't fit, then you have a bone transplant. They need to transplant the bones because they don't have another thing to fit in. Everything now is tailored to your mouthpiece that you need. That's manufacturing of the 21st century now. Can you imagine how Australian manufacturing would look like if you don't need molds anymore? if the Chinese are not your competitors anymore? Can you, can you imagine how it starts? What kind of policies do you derive now when this is the manufacturing of the future? They don't have the number of 3D engineers at this moment. They could, of course, decide to train them. But I think at this very moment, we see many more opportunities for 3D designers amongst those who have been living in a free internet world. I think China will quickly learn that their inhibition 
their blockage of a free internet world is going to kick them out of that industry. And they didn't realize that yet. They just want to block YouTube at this moment. But YouTube, I mean, why I need those 3D digital pictures going and around, you know, I need the kind of YouTubes. A very important principle. In natural systems, nothing is done for one reason only. There is never one benefit to be generated from doing something. That's what nature teaches us. Our traditional Harvard business model is you have one objective with one competence and you do nothing else. That's how it's been designed and developed over the past 50 years. So what we're looking at is how do you actually generate from something that's a waste like coffee, you generate a substrate for a shiitake. Shiitake grows three times faster on coffee than it ever does on oak. As a result, we outcompete the Chinese farming shiitake. We provide it cheaper with local labor based on a resource that is widely available. And whatever is left over, we give to the pigs or the chickens. Three revenue streams. Let me go through this farm. Here is South Africa, a citrus farm. The citrus farm was not competitive in the global market. And they invited a company called McKinsey to advise them on how to become competitive again. And of course, the result was that uh, it needed to be automated. They needed to lay off half of the people. The only thing that they didn't realize is that the people that worked there owned the farm. Now, it's kind of easy to lay off people when you know, they don't own the place. But when they own the place, it gets kind of tough. And so they weren't really in agreement. So here, I'm going to go quickly through the solution that we have. Our philosophy is generate more revenue with what you have. If you do that, you will have forever the generative capacity. Step number one, anyone who has been to Kruger Park in South Africa? Beautiful lodges, isn't it? Right next to these farms. So you have the lodges and the farm. The farm, of course, produces fruits. The fruits, we make a juice. The juice is sold to, of course, the local lodges. When you have a juice made, then you have peels left over. The peels, only by using steam, you can extract something that's called delimonene, and that is an excellent detergent. Now, I can offer the laundry service to those lodges with my delemonine, but I'm using my irrigation water, because in my irrigation water, the only contaminant is the detergent made from the peels from my fruits. It's no contaminant. And as a result, we relieve all the contamination of these artificial soaps of these lodges, and we actually have the opportunity to reuse the water two times. In a drought-stricken region, you know the problem, right? Of course, when you have a, a farm with a lot of trees, you need to prune them. The prunings, on top of that, you have none of, a lot of non-native species that need to be removed. Of course, in the prunings, we grow the mushrooms, and of, we have wood left over that is a good firewood that can be used in the lodges, and then we have wood with which we can construct. And, and of course, the waste in the mushrooms, that becomes an animal feed, and the waste from the peels after extracting, extracting the delimonine is also a feed, and maybe you didn't realize when you're staying at the lodges, but 60% of the food prepared at the lodges is never eaten. It just stands there and then is removed. If you have so much feed, you better have some pigs. If you have pigs, well, then you should be able to have uh, some biodigesters. And what you're seeing here is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, Eight revenue streams right there before you. We doubled the employment on the farm. Double employment on the farm, and we had exactly the same reality to work with as our friends from McKinsey. But we saw the connections. We saw the usefulness as an ecosystem can. Now, Australia is bouncing back from its uh, tremendous drought. And your farms are hopefully bouncing back. Well, I hope they're bouncing like this. I hope they're bouncing like this, because this is the way that you generate the jobs 
produce a multiple not only in food but also in many other benefits for the people who today have a hard time surviving from the land. Systems simply generate much more. This one I still have to give to you before we go on to discussions and I will use uh, the other elements in the discussions because I'm sure we're going to be able to get back to it. Oh, I still have seven minutes. Oh, okay. Thank you. CO2. Have you heard about the debate about CO2? Have you heard about coal and CO2? Yeah, I, I think it's been somewhat debated in, in Australia lately. Now, the chimney you see there is a coal fire power station in Porto Alegre, Brazil. And of course the scrubbers to take out the socks and the knocks has all been installed already. We're taking the CO2, pump it into the retention basin of the cooling tower. Because you know the water from the cooling tower is still too hot, you can't release it into a river. That retention basin allows us to farm spirulina algae and chlorella. Now who said CO2 is a problem? The one who doesn't know what to do with CO2 has a problem. In Brazil, thanks to the CO2 of the coal-fired power station, we generate enough spirulina to give a gram of spirulina a day for free to 240,000 children. A gram a day to every child. Would you know what it means for every child to get a gram a day of spirulina? We produce it at half a dollar a kilo. Half a dollar. Anyone here is taking spirulina pills? We're doing it for a fraction of the costs. But we have so much, there are not enough kids anymore. So now we're forced to do some biodiesel. So we're doing the biodiesel with the leftovers of whatever we supply to the kids. And the biodiesel, when you press out those lipids, you have a residue. And that residue, you have esters. And those esters are converted to polyesters. And these polyesters are great for cosmetics, not to make plastic bags. And so the biggest revenue we generate from the CO2 from the coal fire power station is actually the polyesters that goes into the cosmetics. Have you heard about that? Do they debate this in... No. Why not? Now in Brazil we now have 35 masters in algae farming. 35. How many do you have at this university? <laughs> and we have already eight PhDs and we got another million dollars from the Brazilian government to have four more PhDs in learning how to polyesterize, polymerize esters from the membranes of the algae because everyone realizes that's where the cash is. Now that's Brazil. <clears throat> Brazil only has five coal fire pies, five coal fire power stations. That's all they have. And that's their focus. It's the powerhouse, the last investment from Brazilian investors locally of Rio Grande do Sul is $150 million to scale it up, provide more cheap food for children, provide more biodiesel, and of course benefit from the luxury that some people permit themselves to put polyesters in cosmetics on their face. This is yes an open market and we are benefiting from the open market that some people are so keen on having food fuel and chemicals but on top of that we're getting carbon credits on top of that we're getting carbon credits the infrastructure is for 90 percent financed thanks to the fact that the coal fired power station already has the scrubbers already has the retention basin and i've been suggesting to ian that what we should be doing is actually or you should be doing is when you're exporting your coal, you should bring this package with it. it. Would make a lot of sense. Because your coal will be recognized in the world as the coal that eliminates malnutrition. The coal that makes it possible to have biofuels, thanks to the CO2. This is the positive thinking that we're trying to bring to the equation. And of course, this has a major impact on the policy making. Brazilian policy. <coughs> has been very much influenced by the fact that we are using this 
Are we all behaving like the pelicans in Peru? Are all the pelicans looking in the same direction? No. Here's one. Here's another one. Yeah, and there's another one there. He puts his head in the, in the water. He doesn't want to see anything. You know, when we're going through a creative process of finding solutions for our challenges in society, we can't all look in the same direction. Some people have to look in the other direction. And that is really the mentality we need. And therefore, to, to tease you or to please you, would you mind responding to the question, what is the most available source of energy that you see on this light, freely and abundantly available? I'm sorry, it's gravity. <laughs> it's not the sun. You didn't see right. The sun only shines on half the earth for half of the day. Gravity works all the time. But we have a problem that in our society we have decided on a standard that is called 110 or 220 AC alternate current. And when you have to convert power generated from gravity, you're in DC power at 6 or 12 volts. And therefore you're not competitive. So what's your solution? Change the standard. As simple as that. We have started to filing the procedures in Germany to obtain the permit to have buildings solely operate on 24 volt DC. Now that pillar there, that one right there, how many tons do you think it carries? And that pillar there, how many tons do you think of compression strength is? Any guess? More than one, right? Do we agree more than one, more than ten? 50, each one 50. For every ton of compression strength, we can generate 6 volts of electricity in DC. The complete lighting system here, plus the camera we're looking at, plus my computer, plus all your cell phones can be powered simultaneously, solely from the compression strength of this building. Piezoelectric. electric, exactly. Sustained pressure, but we need to change the roof. Because the roof has to allow us to have minute movements. Otherwise, it's not going to work. But that means we have to teach the architects how to make those roofs. So that whatever Kepler taught us, you remember Kepler? Whatever Kepler taught us is actually working for us. Now, this is the kind of innovation where we're pushing things forward, but it has to be translated into something that's permitted. So part of our exercise in the blue economy is change the rules of the game. If the rule of the game is AC, then renewables have little chance to succeed. But most of the consumption in a building like this, in a university or in an office or at home, is all DC. All. Edison will be pleased. Edison, he lost against Westinghouse, I know. Well, Tesla sold it to Westinghouse and never got paid for it, really. So the history is very beautiful. Now, to conclude my introduction and to then go on to your questions and answers more directly, you remember this proverb? Would you finish it for me? If you give someone a fish, he will not be hungry for the day. If you teach him how to fish, you feed him for life. <laughs> This is the problem we're stuck with. The wisdom of today is not taking us to the future. The wisdom of today, if we only teach our children what we know, our children can never do better than we do. And that is the reason why we need to have these new ways of being inspired, these new innovations to be applied, those new business models to go through. And we have to remember one thing. David versus Goliath. Who won? David won. Why did he win? Yes, but he changed the rules of the game. The big guy thought it was a wrestling match, and before he got to the match, he actually had already stone right in his face. 
So what we're in need of is we need entrepreneurs, we need innovators, we need the people who are prepared to do what we can to change the rules of the game. And the rules of the game are based on doing better, of meeting basic needs for all. I, I would like to finish off here with my introduction and just field your questions. And I'm sure I can refer to some other cases that I have here in the computer. Okay? Okay, well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, could I initially just thank uh, <coughs> Gunter very much indeed for a, a real mind-broadening talk, I think, in terms of where we might be going, because I think what we need in this country is a lot of mind-broadening, and this is certainly the, um, one of the ways to do it. Um, I'm Ian Dunlop. I'm a fellow of the Centre for Policy Development. I've uh, been working with uh, Gunter on these um, issues. Uh, we're also both members of the Club of Rome, so there's a long-standing issue about uh, how you manage these sort of problems, I think, uh, in a society where population is growing and consumption is as well. Well, look, um, we have, I think, about um, 20 minutes, half an hour or so. So could I open up the, uh, the floor for questions, please? Um, there is a microphone over on the side. If you have questions to ask, could you just line up at the mic and uh, perhaps if you just um, give your name to kick off with, if you would. My name's Carol O'Donnell. Before the last financial crash, I had ethical investments. Now, whether you call them ethical investments or green investments or blue investments, they were the investments that went back is, back, backwards fastest and crashed fastest when the last financial crash came along. What I'm asking you is how will you be able to make the next, the future, any different from the past, which involved a whole lot of people like you coming along and basically displaying the wonders of science, but operating within a commercial confidence paradigm, which is basically being forced on them by a feudal English common law and statute paradigm which remains well, in the modern era. What okay, makes well I think we have the question. I think we might try and get an answer to that so everybody else can have right, a bit of a talk to... you are different to any other venture capitalist? Good question. Can we... bang ideas. Fine, thank you. Well, we're not a venture capitalist society. We are my organization operates like a foundation. That means we operate as a foundation. We have registered in 26 countries activities as a foundation. So we're basically non-profit and we do not operate on the basis of investments. We operate on the basis of sharing what we know so that more people can be inspired to do better based on benchmarked experiences around the world. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing your ideas. As a young Australian, I think it's very important for us to hear these sort of positive business case studies. So I wanted to ask quickly a question grounded in, in this idea. This is actually an Australian innovation. Um, it's a solar power light. It's 1.5 watts and it's sold by a company called Barefoot Power in 40 countries worldwide. It's sold direct to the poor. Um, so this is bringing micro energy to poor communities across, across the world. So I'm very proud of it being an Australian invention to be able to talk about it tonight. But my question to you was, we're reaching one million people so far with our kids, but there's 1.5 billion people in the world without access to sustainable energy. So what's your advice for kind of talking to the investment community and reaching out to investors? Because obviously you've had a lot of experience in that. I think perhaps the most important suggestion is don't talk to investors. Don't talk to them. Don't talk to investors, don't talk to the banks. I mean, I wouldn't lose my time with it because it's not going to help you. It's not going to push you forward. I mean, that is part of a paradigm that is not working anymore. Investors today want to have zero risk and high return. That's an interesting principle. 
but it's not the way that we push these things. So there are a series of other principles that we apply. Um, I don't know, what's the cost of this apparatus? It's about, um, about five weeks of kerosene, so it's about $15. How many dollars? Fifteen dollars. You should compare that to the technology. It's called the Humdinger. Yes, I've You heard of uh, Sean Frayne and the Humdinger? Yes. He's doing it for a dollar fifty. Yes, which is also a game changer. And and that gives you light as well. And actually, we put them on flagpoles, um, so that in any Buddhist country where people are putting out prayer flags, they generate electricity while they're praying. I saw that in Bhutan. Yes, we do that in Bhutan. So. What, what my main suggestion would be, first of all, compare who are the other crazy people around who do comparable things. Second, make certain that you are absolutely at the bottom of the costs. Absolutely at the bottom of the cost. Is there still a battery in there? No, and I argue this is not affordability. So, no battery? Good point. If there's no battery in there, then we have to make certain that we eliminate the metals. And it's a very difficult thing. Now, on the photovoltaic solar cells, there's one little new technology. I don't have it in here, but Ian has heard it too many times already, so I didn't want to bother him again. But photovoltaic cells actually work on both sides. And so what we need is just a little mirror in there so we can have concentrated solar power on the bottom of your solar cell. I'll take it up with you after. Thank you, Professor. Okay, next, please. All right, my name is Peter Gillen Small. An economist once told me it wasn't a fair question to ask how economic considerations could lead to, sorry, how sustainability could lead to equity. They said it was more a question of social and economic, so social and political forces. Can you explain how, without changing the current way wealth is distributed, the principles underlying your blue economy can lead to sustainability and also gender equity? So, in the first place, if we have a common agreement that the, the priority of our business models is to respond to basic needs, then of course we have to say what are the basic needs. Basic needs is water, is food, is health, is housing, is energies, is jobs. That are the basic needs that we have decided to focus on. So, when you have a business model that has the capacity to outcompete, not just do better or compete, but outcompete the present system, then you actually have a new business model that can change society. You cannot do it without generating more value. I didn't say cash. You can only do it when you generate more value. And so that is really the program that we're focusing on, and you've seen several of those. Now, our mushroom farming program is 98% run by women, 98%. And so we have pockets of these initiatives where apparently it's uh, really empowering local communities with what they have. And if you were to have the chance to get my book, it seems to be very difficult in Australia to get it. You have about 100 examples, 100 examples, where we target at all the Millennium Development Goals, including women empowerment, all of them, by having a business model that is designed that can do it. But we can't put ourselves out of the framework of reality. There is a market system that is there. And before we've changed it around, I'm probably not going to be around anymore. Um, hi, my name is John. Um, I'm just interested in the community sort of operations like the Maggot Farm and the Kruger Farm. I was just wondering, is there like an efficient size of these types of projects where they remain lucrative or can they get too big or be small enough to be too ineffective? Um, so I haven't addressed this particular theme, but one of my focuses is not to go for economies of scale. We go for what we call economies of scope. 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 Because it means that if, if I have a maggot farm, there is a certain limit where, you know, I just don't want to have an abattoir with 10,000 cows being, you know, killed every day. So I'm going to have to go to a reasonable size of the interconnected workings. And if you apply economies of scope, then you're not focusing on your ever lower marginal cost price, which is the American model, 
we're focusing on the value that is generated with your available resources. Scope? What would you do with an American? This is my scope. I see many different opportunities being interconnected together. It's my scope. This is the breadth of my activities instead of the focus on one activity. The integrated problem, not just one silo. The scope means what you see. Microscope telescope. Yes. You've, you see what you have before you. So, size is a very important one. We feel that, on the other hand, if you are, for example, mushroom farming in an inner city setting, your size is going to be different than when you're doing it on a farm. Because you work with what you have. And that's going to be an exercise over time. But the key thing is that in any project we initiate, it's always multiple revenues, multiple benefits, multiple projects connected. Local community first. So, for example, if we have a mushroom farm in Ghana, we have set up last year more than a dozen mushroom farms in Ghana in the villages. 90% of what is produced is consumed locally. 90%. The 10% is the higher value mushroom of the specific bigger types and of the greater quality for which you can get a premium price in the Kumasi market or in the Obuasi market. And therefore, we will make use that that is actually generating much more revenue for the local community because in the end of the day, it's the same protein base. It just looks nicer. That's all. And therefore, you get a better price for it. Thank you for your inspiring speech. My name is Joanne. Um, I'm interested in more of the cultural, um, the, uh, the artisanal choreographic practices specifically, but that could be um, extended to any sort of art practices that are labour intensive, that create and develop different knowledges to that scientific empirical sort of knowledge. And I'm wondering how um, your integrated holistic approach incorporates and actually sustains that um, part of hu the human um, whole you know, yeah. package. Because I know there is the houses and water and food and these things are important for the material facets of the body. But there's more to us <laughs> than just that. My normal introductions at academic level is six days. I've given 45 minutes. So I didn't go into what we call, and you can check on the website, the five intelligences. In everything that we do, we work on the development of five intelligence. Number one, science. Number two is, of course, the intelligence of the emotions. Number three is the arts. Number four is seeing the connections. Number five is making it happen. And we do, when we're in New Mexico, we're initiating new programs, for example, for the recycling of glass, we do it with raperos, we do it with rap. Because if you can't rap it, you can't get anyone in the community interested. So it's based on the rap. When we're teaching science to 12-year-old kids, we do it with dance. We have choreography that is based on dance in order to teach what is hydrophobic and hydrophilic. It's dance. So it is part, and you will find a lot of it on our website. It has to be holistic, of course. Thank you for that question. <laughs> Hello, my name is Olivia Dunn. I'm a PhD student in the School of Geosciences here. I was wondering if you have any examples of innovations um, that have been successful in the areas affected by saline soils. Oh, and yes. I've got um, in mind here saline soils in delta areas of Asia. Well, particularly in the delta areas in Asia, no. But in Eritrea, see. In Eritrea, we have it. And of course, when you have, uh, and we do it now in Japan, because after the tsunami, you have this massive flow of uh, salt that has been sitting on the, on the rice paddies, and the rice paddies are supposed to be infertile for the next uh, five, 10 years. Yes, of course. Uh, salinity is a key part of our mismanagement of the earth. And we have, in, we have induced salinity in so many parts. Rajasthan is one of the greatest cases. So let me talk about, since you asked Asia, uh, let's talk about Rajasthan. Rajasthan had, uh, by the Swiss government, more than 140, 140 wells dug. And of course, after merely two, three years, they all turned brackish. 
that meant the welds couldn't be used anymore. So when people are in trouble, they need some crazy ideas, sometimes they come to us. So the Swiss government came to us and said, we're stuck, we're going to have to close all those wells again. Because people keep on using the brackish water and it's going to destroy the soil forever. So we installed a system whereby we have, you know those, those drip irrigation systems, those very cheap drip irrigation, we use it but without the holes. And we let the brackish water in the morning when humidity is high, in the morning in Rajasthan, humidity can get 60-65%, then we pump the water up and we let it flow through those black pipes and we have condensation. So we have the same effect as was originally intended to, but we still keep on using the existing, unfortunately, brackish water pits now. As a heat sink. As a heat sink, exactly. So this is again one of our typical things. Let's understand the physics of what's been happening here. The chemistry has gone wrong, it's gone, it's gone brackish. But let's use the physics and let's use the temperature differential. In the case of Eritrea, we have started the largest with a man called Carl Hodges. Anyone knows Carl Hodges? Carl Hodges is the key person in the world to do mangrove farming. So the whole coastline of Africa, from Eritrea all the way down to Mozambique, used to be a massive, massive mangrove uh, forest. It's gone. Eritrea is the first country that put about 18 kilometers of mangroves back. And the mangroves are farmed because they're the best desalinizers. And so the, the tops of the mangroves are, are cut off uh, every six weeks in order to feed them to the goats so the goats don't overgraze anymore. That's another project that uh, has been implemented. And in Australia, in Port Augusta, you have the first seawater farming project in the world. Did you know that? Yeah. It's a very innovative system developed by Charlie Patton, an Englishman. It's a 2,000 square meter farm established in Port Augusta where the only water used in the farm is straight seawater. I'll give you the links. It's case number, mm -hmm, I don't know by heart. If you go on my Blue Economy website and you look at seawater farming, you will find the case. It's the most innovative case of farming. It eliminates drip irrigation from the earth. And it's using, again, the differential of the temperature between the roof, on which you put the seawater, and you use cold water from the slightly deeper ocean to pump through the roots. And if you have cold roots and a hot environment, then you have much better osmosis. And your plants and your tomatoes grow faster than the best GMO in the world using seawater. I can go on. I have a whole file of seawater related projects. One more question. Thanks for your inspiring talk. Uh, my name is Manuel. Um, I was wondering, in your talk you highlighted the um, contrast between the, um, the approach that McKinsey took versus your, uh, took, um, versus your approach. Um, are you finding there's just a lack of awareness or is there a lot of resistance to the um, low economy sort of approach? I would like to believe it's ignorance. I would like to believe that they just don't know. And, and we have, to, we, we, you know, I understand your emotions about America, etc. We have been brainwashed for 60 years with the Harvard business model. Harvard University business model has been brainwashed on us and that's the way we look. We look at cutting costs, not generating more revenues. We're looking at ever higher volumes of production to reduce the marginal costs ever lower, making abstraction of everything else. And now if that's the way you've been trained and that's how you make your $500,000 a year, why would you change? I mean, most of the people don't change when they're doing well. We only change when we're not doing well. And I think this is where, that is why, I mean, the framework of my visit to Australia, we're, I like to go to the universities and to speak to the universities because we need to give this other option. It's not this is the model. No, this is one way of doing it, but there are other ways of doing it. And I think it is my lack of exposing enough people to the opportunity. So from now on, you're exposing them. It's your responsibility. <laughs> I'd like to ask you a question about, uh, following on from that in a way, 
Um, we've been experiencing here, and I'm sure it's happened in other places in the world, um, governments basically milking public utilities like energy and water, getting dividends to kind of basically mean they don't have to tax the population so they can get re-elected because they're getting the revenues. And we also have the problem with the uh, poker machine and other forms of gambling here, very popular. Um, I'm just wondering, um, have you seen this in all places around the world in developed economies or what different forms does it take? And uh, have you got any response? Because personally I see energy saving as the way of the future rather than creating new forms of energy. You know, so in, in terms of savings being a revenue-driven uh, model for the future rather than you know, increasing uh, production of the utility for water, energy, whatever. Permit me to close off with an example uh, from Spain. And that may respond partially to your question, not perfectly, but let me use the power of the podium to give you this example. Eleven years ago in Spain, on an island uh, called El Hierro, I don't think anyone here has been to the island El Hierro. El Hierro Island is a small island next to Tenerife. And the uh, citizens of the island, uh, about 12,000 people strong then, said they wanted to have a sustainable island. And the question was, how do you get a sustainable island? And of course, everyone concluded that the first step was renewable energies only. Now, the island required, and I was involved 11 years ago, three decisions. Decision number one, are you deciding in the year 2000, it's now 2011, are you deciding that you will have self-sufficiency in energy and water? Now, this I'm, I'm, I'm very, very critical in this point. It's not about self-sufficiency in energy, it's energy and water. Because if you're only looking at energy, you're, not, you're missing the point. The key for life is water. Water is a commons. Water should be for free, or at least much cheaper than we're offering today. So the policy that we asked the people to endorse through their policy makers is, yes, we want to be self-sufficient in energy and water. What was the result? that the public utility company, which is typically energy and water there, had to become one. Very important policy decision. Now, if they become one, if I'm the owner of and the energy and the water utility, I'm not seeking a stable contract with the water utility. Because the people who own 70% of this think that water is very important. They've just said, we want to go for self-sufficiency. And as a result, the energy is first used for all the important needs. Second, the energy is pumped up by water into higher basins. And third, all leftover energy is used for the reverse osmosis installation. At what price do you think it is? Of course, it's, it's the residual energy that you couldn't pump up anymore, that you couldn't sell anymore. So what's the price? Just about nothing. And so as a result, water became much cheaper. Now, if you have cheap water, then you have another decision. The island is able to produce all the water it needs, but all the water it needs is produced at half of the costs, double the volume. If you, have, if you go to the farmers and say you get double the amount of water at half the price, what do you think they say? They love you. They think you're great. So, quid pro quo. You get double the, mod the amount of water for half the price, you go organic. The whole island goes organic because if you have to make a choice between the use of all the chemicals and the use of abundance of water, what do you choose? Water. So as a result, the island has gone to a commitment in, in the year 2000 to go organic by 2017. And why 2017? Because they first needed to deliver the water. Now the water is being delivered already today, the pineapple, the bananas, and all the goat related products are organic already now. Third decision. All vehicles on the island go electric. Why? Because with the innovations that you see coming through in the reverse osmosis, and I'm not going to go into the details, you can find it on our website, we are actually able to cut the energy consumption as we imagine in the year 2000 today with 70%. Now, if you have a 70% reduction of uh, electricity consumption for your production of water, makes water even cheaper, but then you have an excess of energy. What do you do with that? 
Well, the decision was made to supply the energy for electric vehicles. Now, there are 6,000 electric vehicles purchased on the island. Now, I did not realize when we said 6,000 vehicles that we, as a little island of 12,000 people, did the biggest purchase of electric vehicles in the world. In the world. I mean, we're only 12,000 people there. But what is happening is the biggest purchase in the world is 3,000 units by one bundling of purchases in Spain. So having 6,000, then we, we realized that we had actually power to influence the batteries because all the big companies wanted to have that contract for 6,000. And we said, we don't like your battery. The battery needs to be changed. We came to an agreement, and you saw perhaps the original slides. The car is sold at 9,000 euro. What's that? 12,000 US dollars, 13,000 US dollars. You have an electric vehicle, four, four seat, four door sedan for 9,000 euros. How is it possible? No. In European tax system, this is cheaper than your normal sedans. So we make 40 hours of hemp. Well, we can go to the hemp discussion later on. There are a lot of hemp people here, I'm sure. But the beauty of it is that we succeeded in getting the battery not as part of the car but part as a stabilization of the grid. So the four old gas stations are converted to battery recharge stations and since the island is only 50 kilometers across we don't need these big batteries we can do with smaller batteries the cars get lighter and so on and so on. Long story short the batteries are purchased by the electric company that is in charge of the water pumping. Because in case there is no wind anymore and we still need electricity, at least we need to have that backup and we need to have that stabilization for the base load supply. And the result is that all the batteries are purchased by an electric company. The whole package that you see here has been agreed by the people, voted by the people, and implemented to the benefit of the people. The total investment is 135 million euros now, 135 million euros for 12,000 people? What kind of a budget is that? It's all based on that good old financial analysis of risk. And it is all based on that second good analysis, how much is the value of the land where you have organics only, where you have wind only, and instead of having an island where there is a shortage of water, you now have an island with an abundance of water. It's exactly the same strategy as I started in 1984 in Colombia in the Orinoco. You generate more with what you have, the land of the value, the va land value will go up. And go up to a point that you become bankable. Now you can go to the banks and tell them we don't need you. Thank you. <laughs> Well, ladies and gentlemen, I think we've reached the end of our allotted time. Um, I think you'll agree it's been a fascinating talk. Um, this country has some very, very big problems looming, which we're all aware of, I think, in terms of the, uh, the debate that's currently going on amongst our leaders in Canberra and other places. Um, we do tend to get very stuck in a new, very narrow view, I think, of the, what the solutions to that might be. But I think what's crystal clear is that um, the size of the challenges we've got and the speed with which we ha actually have to address them are far greater than we're being led to believe politically or indeed corporately. Uh, I think what Gunter, Gunter's shown this evening is that there are solutions out there that will come completely out of left field if in fact you let the opportunity for innovation really rip in the way that I think we're going to see in the next few years because we do need big change to happen very quickly. And I think it's really encouraging to know that these things are happening around the world. We may not be as aware of them here as we should be, but the fact that Gunther has managed to open our eyes I think a bit this evening is certainly a contribution to solving that very big challenge. So please join with me in thanking Gunther again for a fascinating talk. This is Big Ideas from the ABC.